So today we start our discussion on the last chapter before exam number two. This is 24-1, uh, broadly speaking, talking about Gauss's law. Um, but so far what we have seen is that occasionally we have circumstances where we can use symmetry as one of our tools. Right, we've got all these integrals, we've got all this algebra, all of that stuff that we've been using that we've had to been using this entire time. But occasionally, like in the case of the vertical rod, the electric field from that, we said, hey, um, can't we recognize that there's a symmetry in this problem? And that symmetry, we can use that to avoid doing more work. Right, we can still go through the problem like standard, but this is like a little shortcut that we could take. Sometimes there's symmetry that's available to us that we can utilize to skip an integral or see where things are going to cancel out to give us a little bit more insight as to what's going on in the problem. And up until this point, it has been, well, mostly voluntary if we'd like to do that. But after today, we're gonna start to find that there are a lot of cases where it's still technically voluntary, but let's just take a look. What if we were looking at the electric field of a charged sphere. So let's think about this. We need to find our element of charge dq, that's rho dv, but every single dq has its own r, has its own r hat, and now to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, every single r hat changes and it's in three dimensions instead of just two. This is not a kind problem. And if you've watched Dr. Alexander's lecture, he, he makes a point of talking about how he has gone through and done this integral. He's needed to find this integral for a few different things and he found what it was, mostly because he was dealing with gravitational fields. Um, but he found what it was and this integral took him four, five, six pages to write everything out. It's not short, it's not easy, and most of all, it's not fun. And if it's not fun, well, I don't wanna do it, right? So there has to be a better way. There has to be an easier way to find all of this stuff. And the answer to that is Gauss's law. And I really don't put this lightly, uh, Gauss's law is like our brand new sonic screwdriver that's going to take some of these extremely complicated problems and make them very nearly trivial. And I really don't put that lightly, right? I, I, I don't use that word a lot because it's one of those things that's except in a joking manner, right? I know that gets used all the time uh, as, as the running joke of every single science textbook. You know, the impossible problem has been left as an exercise for the reader. You know, it's trivial, it's clear to see, stuff like that, right? I know where those terms come from and everything else, but I, I, I really do say that in this terms of the comparison of difficulty from five pages of calculus down to fast algebra, right? And not even crazy algebra or anything else like that, but fast algebra. But we need two things for it. We need to talk about two different things. We need to first understand the different types of symmetries we might see in our systems. And we also need to understand a term called flux. So let's start with symmetries. Here's some descriptions if you'd like to talk about them in you know, more explicit terms. But um, generally, the best time to use Gauss's law as we're going to see it is when we are in some type of symmetry. We either have a planar symmetry, a cylindrical symmetry, or spherical or radial symmetry. Any of the three of these, we're in a good spot to use Gauss's law, right? So keep that in mind. So the planar symmetry is any time I have an infinite plane or even I take a square, rotate a square by 90 degrees. Wow, it's still a square, right? If it doesn't have any features or anything else and I close my eyes and somebody rotates that square, I've got to do it for 90 degrees for that one, but imagine it's a disc instead. Right? If they rotate it around every which way, and then I open my eyes again and I look at it, will I be able to tell that it's been spun around? No. That's a symmetry. Cylinders. Right? I can spin these things around the long axis. You know, I can't swing them around because I can tell that there's a difference then, but if I just spin them in place, I'll never be able to tell. 
if as long as they have a symmetry and that one, that's a useful thing. And then finally for spheres, remember I can kind of turn this thing all over and if there's no discernible features on the outside and I can't tell a difference if I've spun it around or not, that is a symmetry as well. Now, our second row here is trying to imply something as well, that it doesn't just have to be these three basic shapes. If I take a parallel plate capacitor, if I go crazy with that, five layers, something like that, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, if they're all a bunch of infinite planes and I spin them all around at the same time, that's still symmetrical, right? It's still a symmetry, even if I stack a lot of different plates together. If I have something like a coaxial cable, which is a lot like the cable that might be bringing internet into your house or room right now, uh, that works just as well. It's a cylinder inside of another cylinder, and I can do that multiple times over. And if I take multiple cylinders and stack them all together like that, I can still spin the entire thing around, and I would never be able to tell the difference, right? That still has a cylindrical symmetry. And then finally, if I have a bunch of different spheres and I, you know, center them all up together and stack them into however I want, same deal, radial symmetry, right? So we're looking for those cases to be our special cases, but we're not going to quite use them yet, but I'll get back to that. Now, the other thing that we need to understand is something called flux. And flux is one of those terms, if you've ever seen any sci-fi, you've heard of flux, right? Uh, they never use it accurately, but... Yeah, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, it's the name for a specific style of music. It's the name for, uh, I hear flux capacitors all the time. It's like the sci-fi go-to. Um, it's a game. I mean, it's, it's a cool sounding word, right? Let's be honest. It sounds kind of cool, but it actually is a real thing and it has an actual definition. Flux is a bit like flow. It's not quite the same. Flux and flow are different, but if you're an engineer, you might have heard this term used before. How we're going to see it right now is flux is a measure of how much of an electric field passes through a cross-sectional area. So what we see in our picture here, that's a different flux though. That is, I guess that should be an exception. I didn't even think about that. That flux is different. That flux is an actual, it's a, a substance that you use that doesn't quite do the same thing, right? That's probably separated. I don't know if there's any similarity between those two words. Um, I, like, I don't know if there's some common origin between them or not, where that would have come from. But um, so here's how we've got to do this, right? We've got to look at our entire cross-sectional area if we have a sheet, like we've got drawn up on the picture here, right? Inside of this sheet, there is an electric field passing through that. Now, the difficulty that I might face is that, okay, um, well, for every portion of this thing, the electric field passing through it might be different, right? So every element DA has an electric field passing through it, and then I have to integrate all of those points together to actually calculate the, what this flux would be. And, I know a lot of you have not taken Calc 3, right? But this is one of those details that we need to kind of pluck from Calc 3 and just that detail, we don't need a lot from it, but we just need this. If I am looking at an element of area, that has a vector. And that's a little bit strange at first, but it's not too bad. It's given in definition right up here. We've got two things to it, right? First, I've got my area, A, that's geometry, right? There's no difference in that. It's just the area A. If I take a tiny piece of A, then it's DA instead. Our vector n hat is the new one. If you're talking about the vector of an area, the direction of that vector, if I have something like my plane right here, right? It's a completely flat plane. You can mostly see the edge of that thing. If it's a completely flat plane, the normal vector points like this directly perpendicular to the surface. If I tilt it, so too does my normal vector change, right? Any way I point it, and I know it's kind of cutting off and on the camera, any direction I point this, the normal vector is always going to be perpendicular to the surface, which makes it a little bit difficult if I have something that's curved like we see on the picture, because if I have, what's a good thing that I've got? I lost some of my examples. Let me take my coffee scented candle. If I have something like this that's rounded, around the outside, right? What about my normal vector now? Well, at this point right here, it points like this, but if I go around, 
you can see my normal vector would be changing for each element of the area. Each DA has its own direction, right? And then if I go up or down, it stays in the same, you know, that's all got the same in hat. But if I turn around the outside of this thing, in hat changes direction. So keep that in mind, right? That's a detail that we're going to need to wrestle with. But it's always going to be directly perpendicular to the surface at that specific point. Calling it the normal vector, normal means perpendicular or orthogonal. And then the units of this are essentially just combining area and electric field, newton meter squared per coulomb, right? But this is done over a surface integral. When we actually calculate this out, we're looking at dA. Instead of dx or dy, this is dx and dy, right? If I'm integrating over a surface, I'm not just integrating over a single line anymore. It's not just a single line. I'm dealing with two separate variables that I would actually need to integrate over. So let's look at some special cases. Let's imagine that I've got a uniform electric field, right? Like what we might see from an infinite plane. If I take some sort of surface, whatever that is, and let's assume that it's a flat surface. Let's make life easy. Uniform field, flat surface then can we all agree that if I take this right here and I am looking at any point along the entire plane, n hat is the same across all points, right? It never changes direction. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual quantity. Remember that anytime you see a hat over vector that's a unit vector only tells you direction. Can we all agree that there is never a change of direction along this entire plane? Even if I tilted it some weird way, it's always the same direction the entire time. That is going to make this significantly easier to deal with. So if we go to our integral then, we say, okay, well, this whole thing I can rewrite. I don't need to worry about the individual pieces of dA necessarily. Um, but if I look at my integral, I can immediately say, hey, E is uniform. E is a constant. Pull it out of the integral. I don't need to worry about that. Second, I can say, okay, if I'm trying to integrate over the entire area, there's no electric field component to do that. The integral of the area, if I sum up every single point of the area, is literally just the surface area. That turns into vector A. Then I just have a dot product between two vectors. And so we can simplify that to say E A cosine of theta. And then specifically, if we are completely perpendicular, if we are maximizing flux, theta is equal to zero, right? Because the area vector and the electric field are pointing in the same direction. That's when we maximize flux. That's when cosine is zero or cosine of zero equal one, and we get E times A. But in either of these cases, if we have a uniform field and if we have a flat surface that we're looking at, we can simplify our flux equation to just E dot A. That makes that a lot easier. Let's try it out. We have here whiteboard 24-1. I have some rectangle and I know that the total flux through this rectangle is 25 newton meter squared per coulomb. And we can see the angle that the electric field is going through this rectangle. What is the strength of the electric field? So let's go ahead and take a look at this one and see what we've got, right? And I wanna steal this picture. I wanna draw on this thing a little bit. So let's go ahead and go over to, uh, oh, my, uh, possible fixes for this computer. Should it act up again this time? We'll see. So here's what we've got, right? Now what we see is we have a flat plane. We have a uniform electric field, but we already know what the flux is before we even get started, right? They give us the flux as a value here. We have that flux is, what is it, 25 Newton meter squared per coulomb, right? So that's a value that we're given right from the beginning. Something right like that. So we know that this is going to be equal to E dot A. Right, normally this would be equal to this full thing right here, I would say over the surface E dot DA and then calculate this entire thing, right? But we know because a lot of this stuff is simplified, we're in a very specific case where the uniform field and we've got uh, 
an area that's constant over the entire area. This simplifies greatly into E dot DA, or E dot A, rather. And then we can rewrite this. We know dot products can be simplified sometimes to E A cosine of theta. Now here's where the tricky part comes in. E A cosine of theta, that theta is the angle between our two vectors. If I'm looking out over, and I'll, I'll keep this in black for now. If I'm looking at this spot right here where they tell us about the angle, I am looking at the angle between my vector n hat, which I'll draw it like this. Here is n hat. In pink, we have E. So theta is not 60 degrees. Theta is 30 degrees. Knowing that, we go into this thing, we rearrange, we know what uh, our flux is, we have an expression for the area, cosine of 30 degrees, plug that in. When we throw it all together, we should find that our electric field at the end has a magnitude of 1,443 newtons per coulomb. So let's go ahead and keep moving on. So let's do a little bit of a review on this dot product thing, right? Because it's been a little while since we've seen this thing. It's been quite some time, in fact. In that last case that we just saw, dot product was not so bad, right? We had a nice easy plane to deal with. We were given the angle, or just about. And uh, calculating that thing wasn't too bad. However, what happens if we don't have vectors that are so kind? What happens if we have vectors going in weird directions, or maybe my plane is no longer just going to be flat, but it's at some weird skew or something like that? Right? What if my vectors are at weird skews? What if both are at weird skews? What do I do? Well, not to panic, because we have a second way of writing out the dot product, right? The more official way of writing out the dot product, in fact. The dot product, remember, is defined. If I am crossing A, not crossing, dotting A with B, then they are going to come out with a scalar value equal to AXBX plus AYBY plus AZBZ. Sum all three of those up together, you get your final number, right? And that kind of tells us something about flux. And in case we haven't noticed already, flux is not a vector. It does not have a direction. It can be positive or negative, but it does not have a direction associated with it. It is a scalar value. It is just a number. But we have two different ways of dealing with this dot product because sometimes one of the methods is going to be easier. And the problem that we just saw, I would argue that that problem was probably a lot easier if we just would have taken the angle definition. If we're looking at 24-2, though, well, it's not going to be so easy this time. So we have a rectangle in the xy plane. What is the electric flux through the rectangle for these two different electric fields? And I'm going to, for one, recommend that you draw this out. I know it's a little bit weird because we're now trying to make three-dimensional pictures, but I do highly recommend it. And also, you might consider, and I'm going to really recommend this one actually as well. Again, I can't make you do it, but I would recommend taking a notebook or a sheet of paper and physically laying this thing out in some way or another so that you can understand where these things are going, right? I'm using my draw pad a lot for this. If I'm taking my draw pad and I take a thumbs up and I stick it directly on the top here, this tells me about where my area vector is going to be pointing. I can find my electric field in relationship to that. So, some things that I recommend as you get started working on this problem. Okay, so let's start to take a look at this one. So, there's a couple different ways that I might consider drawing this one, and I might consider drawing this with a couple different perspectives to see if that actually helps me at all. One of the ways that I could do this is I could draw this as a top-down view, where my three axes are x, y, 
And then this, whoops, I got that backwards, didn't I? X, Y, and coming out of the page, directly out of the page towards us, is Z. So that's one way that we could draw this. And then we would see kind of our, our axes here and here, right? If that makes sense. So if we're looking at part A, and actually while I'm talking about it, let me go ahead and draw out, let me, let me draw out another axis. So that's one view of this. This is our top down view. We could also have something written. Um, let's imagine we've got, I'm gonna use a lot of line tools here. Try something like this where we have our rectangle. Let me do this in a different color, make that stand out a little bit more. Let's do like a burnt red for this. Here is our rectangle, roughly speaking, kind of, something like this, right? That's not very well proportioned here, but some, um, you know, that's another way that I might consider where this thing is, and I'll go ahead and try and color this thing in. So here's our rectangle as we've got it. Can I make that any, we'll fill in those gaps a little bit. Here's how I might see this thing. And I'm gonna use this in both cases, right? I wanna see if we can draw this thing out, uh, draw both sets of electric fields and compare these two together and see what we, see what we expect to see. So there's a rectangle in one, here's a rectangle in the other. Um, and let's do, uh, let's complete the picture, why not? Like that, right, there we go. Same rectangle in both cases. So if I wanted to draw this out, the first thing I need to figure out is where is my area vector pointing? Remember that it's always going to be pointing perpendicular to the surface. This entire thing is flat. So again, if I wanted to do this with a sheet of paper or something like that, I take my flat object, make a thumbs up, stick it on there. That's the direction of my area vector. So in this case, from our top down view, we are going to expect to see our area vector pointing like this. That's the direction of A. If we go to this other picture, it should be going, and let's make sure it's there, but uh, it should be going like this, along the Z axis. Go ahead and have these things labeled. Right? These are the two different perspectives that we could take. That's my vector A. Now, We've got two different electric fields that we need to think about. Our first one is going to be 100i hat, 50k hat. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that out and we'll put this one, say, in green. Let's make some nice, nasty colors together. So I'll call this E of A just to uh, specify. And what I'm going to do to help me visualize this thing is a little bit hard to kind of pick out where this thing might be off the bat. So what I'll do is I'm going to draw the components of this electric field as it kind of comes through. So first, I would have something like this cutting directly across. Here's my X component. Then I have zero Y component and I have 50 as my Z component. Okay, and if we were to draw that, if we kind of visualize what that looks like, E of X is twice E of Z. Um, so I might expect my electric field to, here's a very bad perspective on this, but maybe something like this, E of A, right? Roughly speaking, or if I do the components again, directly along X, and then a component E of Z pointing directly up. So for either of these, right, the easier thing is not to try and find this angle. The easier thing is to take the fact that we're already in component form. I can write out my area vector A. First, I need to find what is the actual area. A 
would be two centimeters by three centimeters. Or six times 10 to the fourth, 10 to the negative fourth meters, squared meters, I should say. So there's my area. And then we had this definition earlier that said vector A is equal to A times n hat. n hat, we've already determined this thing points in Z. So my vector A is six times 10 to the negative fourth k hat. Now, if I need to find this dot product, I'll call this the flux of A, capital Phi A. We're doing E dot A because it's a uniform field. Piece by piece, 100 times zero. Y components, zero times zero. Z components, 50 times six times 10 to the negative fourth. I'm cutting into my other picture here, but that's okay. No contribution, no contribution. We are left 0.03. Newton meter squared per coulomb. That's our flux for the first electric field. Okay, now if we'd like to look at part B, let's do this one and I'll do this, I do it in orange, make it a little bit weird. Now I'm gonna do the same kind of thing. I'm gonna start by drawing out the three components of my vector and seeing kind of where they line up. So I have my same 100 I hat, but now it's 50 J hat. Okay, well, 100 I hat, here's my X component, 50 J hat my Y component. Does any of my electric field actually pass through my surface? No. Draw it here as well. It goes, and this is kind of a weird, this is the problem with drawing three dimensional things, right? Uh, it kind of skates over top of it without, without actually passing through. That's what EFB might look like, something like that. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see that. And I know that's, that's a, a problem when you're trying to draw three dimensional things with a sheet of paper. That's part of why I recommended go ahead and have a sheet of paper nearby, right? Use that as your rectangle and use your thumbs to kind of tell you what these angles might look like, right? If I was trying to describe this thing again on my surface right here, as I've got my surface, my first one would look something like this. Right, we can see there's a, a component of that, a piece of that, maybe not the entire thing, but a little bit of it actually goes through the surface. But if I look at part B, I'm pointing like this, or if I turn the entire thing, right, I'm pointing directly across it. I'm skating across the top, but none of it actually goes through. And so the flux for this one's going to be zero. And we can prove it if we do our dot product. Let's go ahead and prove it. If I take all of my pieces of the dot product, I have 100 times zero. I have 50 times zero. And I have zero times six times 10 to the negative fourth. We get nothing. It's just zero, like that. Visualization is going to be the difficult part here, right? That really is. It's going to be a little bit tricky to try and deal with that stuff. So use as many aids as you possibly can, right? That's why I like to do a lot of stuff with my hands. That's why I like to grab random things and try and show what would it be like here. And I try and imagine, first, I, I you know, it, this is really my trick for a lot of these areas, right? Just take a thumbs up. That's the direction of the vector. Stick it on things, right? Doesn't matter what it is. If it's a sphere, if it's a basketball, whatever it is, you can just stick your thumb there and say, hey, this is 
that in hat vector, right? That's what that direction would look like. Help yourself visualize these things in your mind so that when we come to these problems, it's a little bit easier to kind of pick apart, right? We don't have to rely on pictures as heavily at that point because we've got, you know, our mind's eye has a really clear picture of how these things might look. Okay. So let's keep moving along for now. So Gauss was an incredible mathematician and a little bit of a physicist, but mostly a mathematician. Um, he had a lot of really, really incredibly fantastic contributions, but Gauss's law is one of the big ones that we remember him for, even though it's like there's all sorts of crazy things he did. Um, but one of his, his development of what we call Gauss's law started from almost kind of a thought experiment here. Let's imagine... I take a point charge, it's a charge Q, and I put a sphere around it, like a Dyson sphere kind of deal, right? I, I just have a sphere that completely encloses this thing and I make sure they're centered up together so the point charge is right in the middle of my sphere. What would the flux through this sphere be? Well, let's go through the integral, right? We would say, okay, well, I'm taking a surface integral over the entire surface area of the sphere, E dot dA. Okay, the first thing's first. If we imagine what is our n hat, what does our a vector look like when we're dealing with a sphere? It's not a plane, right? At any point along the sphere, imagine it's got like a bunch of tiny spikes poking out of it, right? Take a basketball, poke in a bunch of spikes, right? Don't actually do that. Please don't do that. That's dangerous. But take that picture. Every single one of those spikes that sticks directly out that's the direction of n hat at that particular point. So it's, again, pointing radially away from our sphere. What else points radially away? The field of the point charge, right? What we can say here is that E passes directly through A at all points along this sphere. E and DA, or n hat, at that particular point are always aligned no matter where I look at on the picture. Right? And so because of that, my dot product kind of immediately goes away. The dot product is always just going to be equal to the magnitudes. There's no angle between these two vectors at any point along the sphere. Okay, so that's our first step here. The second step, we say, okay, what well, we might also remember that if I'm thinking about something like a point charge, my electric field, kq over r squared, at some distance away r, the magnitude is constant no matter where I'm at around the circle, right? The direction changes, but the magnitude is constant. And at this point, we don't care about direction anymore. We care about magnitude. So the electric field over the entire surface area of the sphere is constant. It's the same magnitude everywhere. So we can pull that out of our integral. Now we're just trying to integrate dA. And that's basically saying, what's the total surface area of a sphere? That's four pi r squared. So our integral comes out to be kind of easy when it comes down to it, right? We don't really have to do an integral here. We just say, okay, well then the total flux is equal to E four pi R squared. Now we take it one step further. We say, okay, well, we remember that the magnitude of this electric field because it's a point charge is KQ over R squared. Go ahead and plug that in. What do we get? When we plug in everything together, we get this crazy result at the very end. That the electric flux through this sphere is Q over E naught, the magnitude of that point charge, and nothing else. Think about what that means. If my sphere is very tiny, if R is very small, it's the same flux as if I made R huge, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't show up anywhere in that equation. Why might that be? Well, if we think about what flux really is coming from, it's electric field strength and area a smaller sphere has a larger electric field, but a much smaller area for that electric field to pass through. Whereas if I expand my sphere to be very, very, very large, sure, the electric field is going to be weaker, but now it's got a much larger area to pass through, right? Because the electric field goes as one over R squared and the area goes as R squared, they cancel out and we're left with Q inside over E naught. Now this was a really crazy kind of result. The flux can be calculated just by the charge inside of my shape. 
Now keep in mind, when I'm talking about inside of my shape, now I'm being a little bit more cautious. We're not looking at the same thing we just saw here, or the same thing we just saw here. These are not closed shapes. These are sheets in some way or another. I can't have a charge inside of a sheet, right? It's two-dimensional. It doesn't have anything to it. I have to be a closed shape. There has to be an inside and an outside, and there's no space in between, right? The surface separates the inside and the outside. Any of my charges on the inside make a difference on my flux. Now, what happens if we were to move that point charge so it's no longer in the center? Well, same argument applies. Right, and that same argument being that the closer surface areas are going to have a stronger electric field, but a lot less area to go through, so the flux is still Q over E naught. If there's no charge on the inside of the shape, then there's some flux coming in, some flux going out, but if we do the math between it, there's no flux net for the surface. Everything cancels out. If I change up my shape, if it's no longer a sphere or an ellipse or anything like that, what if I make it this weird spiky ball? It does not matter. The charge inside is all that counts. And that's a really incredible result. We can imagine, here's kind of an example of some different things here. So this is a, a 2D slice, but imagine if we were looking for some different fluxes. If I wanted a flux of one nanocoulomb over E naught, then I would take this little black shape that I've drawn. If I wanted zero, I could draw what I've got in yellow. If I'm looking at another way to get zero, I could take plus three and minus three. And what we can see is that around the plus three nanocoulombs, there's a lot of flux leaving the shape. And in the bottom, there's a lot of flux entering the shape, but they perfectly cancel out to be zero flux for the entire shape. Just in the same way for the yellow, we can see some of the field lines going in, some of the field lines going out, but there's a net zero flux. In general, for any closed surface, Gauss's law tells us that the flux or the surface integral E dot dA is equal to the Q inside divided by our permittivity constant. And this is the first Maxwell equation that we have seen. We will eventually get to see all four, but Maxwell, the Maxwell equations are uh, four equations that essentially lay the groundwork for everything we would possibly need in electromagnetism. That, along with the uh, Lorentz law, uh, make up everything we could ever need in electromagnetism. And that's kind of crazy. It's five equations that tell us everything, which is really cool, I think. But let's give this a shot together. So I have something like this, right? I have three charges, plus 2q, minus q, and plus 2q. I have four different fluxes. Take this thing, draw out some shapes. How would I get each of these four fluxes based on the charges that I've got on the screen? Draw this thing out. All right, I hope everyone's ready to scribble all over the page with me. So the very first one we need, we need negative Q over E naught. That means I need to have a total internal charge of negative Q. It's gonna look red and it looks like that. Our second one. We need a single positive Q. Okay, well, I've got 2Q, negative Q, and 2Q, so the only way to do that is to take either the top two or the bottom two, and let's make sure it's a closed surface, right? No open surfaces here. Keep going with it. If we are looking at 3Q over E naught, circle the whole thing. Oh, and I need to make sure, again, it's a closed surface. So there can be an inside and an outside. Finally, 4Q, I'm going to avoid my negative charge in the middle and only include my two positive charges. And I know that looks like a mess, but that's part of the fun of just scribbling around on the page. Right, but those would give us the four fluxes that we need. And that's it, it doesn't matter how I drew these things. I could add all sorts of crazy things off in the sides if I wanted to, but only the charges inside actually matter. Okay, so I'm not actually going to play this thing. Uh, during a regular semester, I would have this on presentation mode and this green bar would go down and everybody panics and freaks out and they're like, how do I integrate over a cylinder and what do I do with this and yada, yada, yada. We lock the doors, we turn off all the lights, we throw smoke grenades, all sorts of, you know, we make it theatrical. I'm kidding, of course. But 
I want this to be really, really, really quick. Don't take more than a minute to try and answer this one. What is E.DA, the surface integral E.DA over this cylinder? The clock is ticking, metaphorically. All right, and we're looking for an answer. We might recognize E.DA, that integral is the definition of flux. Let's do this in black. We are looking at the definition of flux. So we can say Gauss's law, and that little circle right there means closed surface. E dot DA can equivalently be described as Q inside over E naught. Q inside is one nanocoulomb. One nanocoulomb divided by our permittivity constant should give us a total flux of 113 Newton meter squared per coulomb. And that's it. We have one more problem for today. I have a cube, two by two by two centimeters. Two of the faces have a flux of 300 Newton meter squared per coulomb. The other four faces have a flux of 100 Newton meter squared per coulomb. And this is all going outwards, I should specify. How much charge is inside of my cube? All right, so let's start to take a look at this one and I'm going to start by drawing a very, very bad cube. So let's imagine here, uh, we've got some sort of professional to draw our front face, right? And then uh, somebody who forgets what geometry is to draw the back half of the cube. Perfect, right? Oh geez, but I should keep closed, closed surface. I wanna make sure I'm being very explicit with that one. It's a closed surface. Even if it doesn't look like a cube anymore, it should be a closed surface. Okay, so what we are told is that this face right here has a flux of 300. The opposing face has a flux of 300. Each other face, 100. 100, 100, 100. Now, one thing that I should start to specify here, when we're talking about areas and fluxes, if we have a closed area, our vector A always points towards the outside. That's one thing that we should kind of keep in the back of our mind. A points outside. And that means that if A points outside, positive flux, positive flux, so flux greater than zero, means E going out. Right, we can have negative flux, that's fine, but that just means the electric field is going in rather than out. So with all of this in mind, we say our total flux is we have two faces of 300, we have four faces of 100, we sum them all up together to get a total of 1000 Newton meter squared per coulomb. Then we can say, okay, well I know that the total flux is equal to Q inside over permittivity constant, E naught. Rearrange this. And what we should find is something like 8.8, .8, oh no, 8.85 or 8.89? Uh, 8.85 times 10 to the negative ninth coulombs or 8.85. Oh, it finally did it, okay. That's okay, that was my first technical issue today. And as long as I end soon, that'll be my last one for today. I'm, I'm very quite excited that it's only been one today. 8.85 nanocoulombs. Well, with that, we will close out our 24-1 lecture.